men of Galilee. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In Revelation 6-2, it says, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. The rider on the white horse of Revelation, chapter 6, is the Antichrist. He will arrive on the world stage that has been painstakingly preparing for him. He is mounted upon a white horse, which implies he is coming as savior of the world. He holds a bow, which is not necessarily what most think it is. He is given a crown, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. The world stage is set. Paul the apostle warned the church through his epistles about the condition of the world in the last days. In fact, in his last letter, which was penned to Timothy, he wrote <clears throat> from 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs was also. From this passage, one may clearly ascertain the fact that mankind will be in a fallen state, just like the days of Noah and Lot, and uh, in the last stage just before the arrival of the man of sin. This would imply that he will assume control of a society with which he has great affinity while conquering all who oppose him. The rapture will remove all those faithful to Christ from the earth. Therefore, the Antichrist will appear to be dealing with the remnants of those who oppose the now dominant worldview which he will champion. This remnant is composed, comprised of all who will be saved during the tribulation period. One further point should be made about the condition of the world just before the arrival of the Antichrist. In the last days, the, the, the inhabitants of the world will not be the only ones who have fallen into severe moral decay. Indeed, many who claim to be holy will succumb to the wiles of the devil and become apostate. This is evidenced by additional warnings from the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Second Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers 
having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Sadly, guys, many in today's church are clearly demonstrating that Paul's prophecies were 100% accurate. This is made manifest by the fact that the ways of the world are creeping into the professing church, and what was once holy and set apart is now indistinguishable from the heathen world. It is clear that preparation is underway for the arrival of the Antichrist, and many will fall for his deception, especially those who desire to maintain earth as their home. Sadly, many of the, many of the uh, professing church are also being primed for the rider of the white horse. You know, the white horse, white, is generally associated with imagery of righteousness and holiness. Therefore, when one rides a white horse, the intention is often to convey the idea that the rider is of the same nature. However, the Antichrist will only appear righteous. In fact, he will be anything but. Instead, he will merely impersonate righteousness as a counterfeit of the true. This explains how he will conquer without a physical weapon. And that is by saying having a bow with no arrow. Instead, his true weapon is deception, which is why Jesus and the apostles fervently warned believers not to be deceived. A word used 39 times in the New Testament alone. In fact, Jesus, in answering his disciples' question about the last days, began his explanation with the words, Take heed that no man deceive you, Matthew 24, 4. He goes on to warn against deception three more times in this same reply, Matthew 24, 4 through 31. In fact, Jesus warned more about deception than any other single thing. This implies the last days will be marked by great deception. Guys, we all know great deception is truly upon the land as many are incapable of discerning right from wrong. In fact, those who now control the narrative are turning truth on its head. However, God foretold of this particular world condition through his prophet Isaiah, who had a dire warning for those who currently manip manipulate the masses. In Isaiah 5.20, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Incredibly, those on the earth are seeing things in an upside-down manner. Ironically, their rejection of the truth is actually preparing them to accept the lie of the great deceiver who will lead them to great suffering and eternal damnation and fire. Revelation 20.15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Guys, the Antichrist will conquer with a gifted crown. Understanding the means by which this writer conquers will be greatly enhanced by the words of the prophet Daniel. Long ago, Daniel had visions that were identified by the angel Gabriel as visions of the last days. In one vision, Daniel sees the Antichrist as one who comes when rebellion has reached its full measure a master of intrigue. Interestingly, this ruler will become very strong by power, not his own. This alludes to the crown the first writer is given. Notice he is given the crown. This would imply that he has not earned it. Instead, he has provided a crown with which to conquer along with power from Satan. Revelation 13.2 Therefore, neither his crown nor power are truly his. He is simply an emissary of Satan. Guys, the Antichrist will literally become Satan-possessed. You've heard of demon possession, but this man 
will be Satan possessed. Just like uh, at the at the Last Supper, it said that Satan entered Judas at the start of the church. A man was Satan possessed. Oh, and after the church is gone, another man will be Satan possessed, called the Antichrist. But Daniel saw this writer in a vision over 2,500 years ago. Daniel 8, 24 and 25 says, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. The fact that the Antichrist will destroy many by bringing what appears to be peace, it provides added weight to the fact that this writer will appear to a very receptive audience. He will ride in as a great champion who truly understands how to deal with the growing deception brought forth by the perversion of God's ways. However, he will not attempt to correct the populace. Instead, he will validate their debauchery. His mission will be to come against and overwhelm those who oppose his contrary ways as he attempts to change what God has established. This mindset is already at work in the world. Daniel foresaw this also. In Daniel seven twenty five it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Fortunately the Antichrist will ultimately decide that he is God, and for this, he will suffer the penalty of being captured on the battlefield called Armageddon and cast into the ever-burning lake of fire. Guys, the first writer pays the way through deception for the entirety of the remaining judgments of the tribulation. His actions will cause a great division amongst those who are left on earth, earth after the rapture. Many will come to saving faith early on, just after the church departs. This is largely due to the fact that they had heard the truth before without embracing it. Don't let anyone tell you that once the rapture happens that no one can be saved. That is not true. There will be multitudes saved after the rapture, guys. However, they did not reject Christ wholesale. Instead, they wanted to linger in the things of this world for just a bit longer. Unfortunately, Jesus will come when they least expect it, and they will have lost their chance to be saved during the age of grace. Now, now they will have to persevere through the tribulation and overcome the Antichrist, and that most likely by laying down their lives. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. The severity of the tribulation will make it extremely unlikely to survive its entirety. In fact, those who find themselves in this awful time will be dealing with hazards from every side. For instance, the very next writer will Take peace from the earth and cause men to kill one another. Revelation 6, 4. Imagine living in a day when neighbor is killing neighbor and no one knows who the enemy is. This is just the next thing on a long list of dangers that will need to be navigated in order to survive. Thankfully, God always has a remnant. And those who make it through to the end of the tribulation will populate the millennial kingdom. And when they go in the millennial kingdom as humans, they will begin to live as long as trees, guys. The first writer, the Antichrist, will come 
as the Savior of the, of the world. And this sounds remarkably like the actions of Christ. However, there is one great difference. Jesus came to save men from the world. The Antichrist will come to save the world from man. In fact, he will champion the causes that unregenerate man desires. The list of these pursuits grows daily as mankind rejects God's ways and leans unto their own understanding. The Bible does not clearly use the phrase one world government or one world currency in referring to the end times, but it does, however, provide ample evidence to enable us to draw the conclusion that both will exist under the rule of the Antichrist in the last days. We've all been seeing both being established, guys. The Apostle John sees a beast, also called the Antichrist, rising out of the sea, having set seven heads and ten horns, Revelation 13, 1. Combining this vision with Daniel's similar one in Daniel 7, 16 and through 24, we can conclude that some sort of world system will be inaugurated by the beast, the most powerful horn who will defeat the other nine and will begin to wage war against Christians. The ten nation confederacy is also seen in Daniel's image of the statue in Daniel 2, 41 42, where he pictures a final world government consisting of ten entities represented by the ten toes of the statue. Whoever the ten are and however they come to power, Scripture is clear that the beast will either destroy them or reduce their power to nothing more than figureheads. In the end, they will do the Antichrist bidding. John goes on to describe the ruler of this vast empire as having power and great authority given to him by Satan himself. Revelation 13, 2. Being followed by and receiving worship from all the world and having authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. From this description, it is logical to assume that this person is the leader of a one world government which is recognized as sovereign over all other governments. It's hard to imagine how such diverse systems of governments as are in power today, would willingly subjugate themselves to a single ruler. And there are many theories on that subject. A logical conclusion is that the disasters and plagues described in Revelation as the seal and trumpet judgments will be so devastating and create such a monumental global crisis that people will embrace anything and anyone who promises to give them relief. Once entrenched in power, the beast, the Antichrist, and the power behind him, which is Satan's power, will move to establish absolute control over all peoples of the earth to accomplish their true end, the worship Satan has been seeking ever since the beginning. One way they will accomplish this is by controlling all commerce, and this is where the idea of one world currency comes in. Revelation 13, verses 16 to 17, describes a satanic mark which will be required in order to buy and sell. No doubt the vast majority of people in the world will succumb to the mark simply to survive. And the mark of the beast will come midway through the tribulation when the Antichrist declares himself God. Again, verse 16 makes it clear that this will be a universal system of control where everyone, rich and poor, great and small, will bear the mark on their hand or forehead. And there is a great deal of speculation as to how exactly this mark will be affixed, but the technologies that are available right now, we can see, can accomplish that very easily. Guys... Those who are left behind after the rapture of the church will be faced with an excruciating choice. Accept the mark of the beast in order to survive or face starvation and horrific pers per persecution by the Antichrist and its followers. But those who come to Christ during this time, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, will choose to endure 
even to martyrdom. The Antichrist, through his craft and deception, will cause many to seal their fate of eternal damnation. The good news is the wise will recognize and avoid falling prey to his wiles instead. They will likely die for their faith, which will be far greater than rejecting Christ. Guys, you know, Jesus is coming. Jesus really is coming. Guys, today is the day to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Many in the tribulation will have a choice. Jesus or Satan. Jesus, eternal life. Satan, eternal damnation. Choose wisely, guys. Today is a day. I tell you, I, I keep feeling impressed of the Lord. He just seems to keep giving me prophetic words. Uh, I don't know, in my spirit, it will go glory. This feels like I'm jumping inside because, man, I tell you, I, I just know we're getting ready to go. I don't know how else to say it. But I, I feel the Lord gave me a word, and, and I heard the Lord speaking to my heart. Though the season has been difficult, you will see victory that will cause you to explode with joy and rejoice in song. The prophetic destiny of your lives are advancing, though it has been through a wilderness of uncertainty. By my power, you will see setbacks turn into comebacks. Time is short. Refuse to be like many that give up and stay sitting next to a tree. I am revealing the plots and schemes that have rem remained hidden out of sight. Keep your eyes focused on what you see me doing and where you see me going. You are just passing through this life, and you are not of this world. What you place focus on is what will grow in your lives. Be careful not to let the negative grow, or it will crowd out my voice. No longer look back, for I am not in your past. Live in the now that is before you. I will never leave you in the dark. I cannot fail. My word is forever settled in heaven and will not change, not even if every star fell from the sky and every hill and mountain crumbled into the sea. My covenant of love for you and my steadfast word will not be shaken. I am not the author of fear, and I am not the God of doubt, but I am the God of overwhelming strength. Confusion and fear are nothing more than the dust of the enemy that is thrown up into the wind. Faith is a light that creates and empowers and sustains and heals you. I have anointed you and appointed you for such a time as this. Leaves change and do not mourn the former. Understanding that renewal and rebirth will soon come in due season. When you are changed in a moment's time, it will be then that death will be swallowed up in victory and all things will become new, says the Lord God of heaven and earth. Thank you, Lord. Guys, we're going home. I want to remind you of Luke twenty-one twenty-eight, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Our redemption is drawn nigh. Nice. Our redemption is drawing nigh. Guys, I thank God 
that he loved me so much that he sent his son to die in my place. Today is the day for salvation. My wife and I love each of you dearly. We have major plans of seeing each of you in the clouds of glory at any second. Until that day arrives, guys, God bless each of you abundantly. And Maranatha. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, heal each one within the sound of our voice, God. Give them hope. Give them hope. Give them health. Give them healing. Give them your everything, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, In Jesus', Jesus name. I love it. The Most High God knows every star by name. Amen. The billions upon billions upon billions of stars, he knows each one by name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows what hurts you and has hurt you. He knows the sickness you're enduring. God is breaking in with breakthrough. The anointing of God is piercing through ooh, the darkness that has surrounded you. Reach out, receive it, claim it. God will make a way where there seems no way. Amen. God is going to make a way for you to come up and out of the pain that's been holding you down. I thank you that you touch everyone's body, everyone's mind, everyone's everything that's watching this this broadcast, Lord God, touch them, yes, heal them, Lord. save them to the uttermost, Lord. Show yourself strong yes. in their lives. Yes. Show that God yes, is God, God and way. he is well able. He is yes. more than able. Susie, just say a quick salvation prayer right now. Okay, right repeat now. this prayer with us if you need Jesus. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to pay the penalty of my sins by dying on the cross in my place. Thank you, Lord, that he died on the cross, but then the third day he rose again so that I can live a life of victory. Lord, I ask you to be Lord of my life and come into my heart. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So if you prayed that prayer in faith believing, you're now 
a child of God. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Your, yeah. your past is past. Amen. Your sins are under the blood. They're behind you. And, and now the, walk forward in, in God. And the Most High wanted me to tell you, do not look behind you because you're not going that way. You keep moving forward. Keep your eyes on the prize which is before you. Amen. Thank you, Lord.